I first of all, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committees to invite me here. It's a big honor for me to be to be here in Egypt. Uh, this is my third visit, if I'm not wrong, and it's a, it's a real pleasure, and I always enjoy. I wish I could have a little more time than which I have at the moment. But what I can say that I, I do not know how to start the naming, so I have made so many friends. I have so many friends from, this, uh, from Egypt and particularly from the MENA region, and here I see my very dear friend, Professor Abdul Al Said. Uh, Adil is probably not here. The, uh, Professor Mezba, uh, Abdul Basit. So I will not go by name because, because I think that then I will be spending the whole day using my name. I say that my dear colleagues, dear friends, my brothers and sisters in the name of Islam. So, so that's, that's, how, that's how I address. And I, in the beginning that what I could say about the IDF that in terms of the uh, 100 years of centenary of insulin, that we have already uh, 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 we have already uh, published one special issue by in the di DRCP Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice on hundred years of insulin. We have uh, from the IDF side we have worked very hard for the WHO to have a kind of resolution to have a resolution for the for the universal access to insulin, which was difficult. Uh, you know that big countries, unfortunately, they do not support such an initiative. This is because of owing to the, uh, their business interest because many of the insulin producing countries actually is not in favor of it because we wanted a kind of, we want a kind of uh, a, a transparency in terms of, its, uh, in terms of its cost. And they, they, they refuse to give us the transparency in terms of the cost transparency. And uh, so, so we had we had some difficulties. We failed in the first instance, and the, then we actually pursued a poor country like Bangladesh, which I, I'm originally from. And the Bangladesh government agreed, and then then we failed finally. And then we the Russian Federation actually came up with this proposal, and this was actually published in May last last year. So we have a WHO resolution about the universal access to insulin. And this is a big achievement, I think, for all the people who are working for, uh, for, uh, for diabetes, not only for the IDF. And as a representative from the IDF, I would like to say there are two things that I see that I see the worries in, in our region globally, that, that we are a member of the ADA, we are a member of the ESD, we are going for this, um, for this meetings or, or not. I have one simple message to everyone that, that we have many friends, but we never forget our parents. You are only represented globally through the IDF, not through the ESD, not through the ADA. But it, I'm not saying that I have anything against these organizations. They are also the member of the IDF. But I say that do not forget that IDF is your organization. IDF is a federation of 230 member associations globally from 172 countries. So they, the basis for global diabetes, as a basis for global IDF is you. And you, there is no IDF without you. And so your representation globally is only secured through the IDF. So that's, that, would be the, that would be the kind of uh, information that I would like to say. Regarding this 100 years of insulin therapy that I'm, I'll, I'll talk, this is a paper that we have published. Uh, re, uh, re, uh, recent, uh, we have published in this same journal, we called race, ethnicity and, um, and challenges for optimal insulin therapy. This was published in 2021. And actually Abdul Basit is also one of the co-author. We had actually, we have authored by, from, from actually 11 countries. Uh, including Stefan Calaguri, Andrew Bolton, myself. So we all saw the importance of the, considering the ethnic variation and the challenges in insulin therapy. 
And this is something that I would like to say that you'll say that in my presentation, I probably, I will be probably a little critical of, of us as doctors and scientists, whether we are doing enough, I will be a little critical in terms of, of the social responsibility of the pharmaceutical industries, that the, that the people should have insulin, access to insulin, that it is also, insulin, the industries are not only to make profit, they also have a social responsibilities. So I will be talking a little bit, but it doesn't mean that I have anything against the pharmaceutical industries or my colleagues who are here. So please do not misunderstand me, even though I will be critical. On, on, the, on my presentation. So I think that we can, we can go to these uh, slides to, to uh, 100 years of insulin. It's, uh, I see that here. Uh, yes, you can see that this, uh, this slide is, uh, is defined as 100 years of insulin therapy, ethnic, ethnicity and challenges. So this is the, this is the article so which I would be, I'll be discussing more in the light of today's discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the uh, initially I'm talking about a little bit of the history that we believe that as as we have I have seen that some of my previous speakers has already shown this because many of us believe that the insulin was discovered 100 years back, which is not correct. Insulin was discovered much before. In 1869, Paul Langerhans, a medical student, as, as has been said, he has already talked about the cells within the pancreas. And in 1916, the Romanian professor Nikolai Paulson developed an extract of the pancreas and shows that it lowered blood sugar in diabetes dogs, which was in 1916. Yeah, Eugene only discovers that the islets of Langerhans produce insulin and that the destruction of these cells resulted in diabetes. This was found in 1901. The next one, please. Uh, can I can I have control or which one is down? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. So and uh, so so comes the insulin industry. I'm talking about a little bit of uh, the NPH and intermediate acting insulin is marked by Danish pharmaceutical company, the Novo Nordisk, in 1950s. And in 1955, the insulin sequenced by British bio biochemist, Frederick Sanger, and was the first protein to be fully sequenced. In 1958, Sanger received the Nobel Prize. In 1963, insulin becomes the first human protein to be chemically synthesized. So in short, in brief, what we can say that in 78, uh, the, the biotechnology from uh, from Gen Gentech used the recombinant DNA techniques to produce the synthetic human insulin and followed by, in 1982, the synthetic insulin is renamed as human insulin. 1985, Novodotis produced the insulin pen delivery system. 1992, the Medtronic uh, releases the Minimed 506. And 1996, Eli Lilly marketed the analogs of insulin and 2000, more than 470, patients with type one diabetes receive the islet cell transplantations. So this is a little bit in short of the, of the insulin uh, industry that has, uh, that has happened in our time. And then the question that comes, insulin with 100 years and access to insulin, that what has actually happened? We see that recognizing that insulin is an essential medicine, but concerned that, that despite being discovered 100 years ago in 21, Globally, about half of the people in need of insulin have no or irregular access or unacceptable inequalities between and within the countries. 50% of the people globally do not have access to insulin, those who need it. And more importantly, that if you look at geographically, that while in sub-Saharan African countries, this number was found to be only one in seven people one in seven people have regular access to insulin. So this is what we have achieved in 100 years. While the industry became $100 billion business. Insulin business of today is $100 billion. Three companies dominate 97% of the world market. Three companies, actually 97% of the world market is dominated 
by three companies. And they are the companies who objected this WHO resolution. Where is our social responsibilities? Where we colleagues as doctors, scientists are raising this issue with our partners. We should, co we should cooperate with them. We should cooperate with the, with, the, with the pharmaceutical industries. I have no objection with that. But we also have a responsibility to tell them that what is needed on the ground, are we doing it? In uh, Lawrence in 1922 declared that now the modern discoveries, particularly insulin has completely changed the outlook. There is no reason why a diabetic person should not, if he can be taught to do so, lead a long, normal life. Have we secured it? We need to, we need to ask ourselves critically that we celebrate so, with so many Congresses, we celebrate, but at the end of the day, what we celebrate? If we look at these gaps in desired outcomes, the numbers needed uh, needs in diabetes care. As you say that out of, out of, first of all, the 50% of the people are diagnosed. Globally that we have, so that means that we have a kind of national plan we need for screening, which is lacking. We do not screen people. There is, very few countries where you can have a kind of national data in terms of the prevalence data, for example, globally, nationally, other than some pocket surveys. You have done some pocket surveys in, for example, in one part of Egypt. Does it mean that this is the national prevalence for Egypt? No. It varies within the countries a great deal. 50% of the people are diagnosed, of whom 50% receive care. Those who are diagnosed, only 50% is receiving the care. Of those who receive care, about 50% they achieve the treatment targets. And of those who receive the treatment targets, 50% or 6% of them actually achieve the desired outcome. So this is the clinical fact. If you look at this A1C, for example, glucose control, we have, we, we, we can see that there are about 30% of the people, patient varies from 30 to 45% actually come but receive the targets. Why it is so? We should think critically that what, what we are doing in our, in our practices. If you look at the cost production of the government procurement and public and private sector, patient prices for human analogs insulin based on 43 countries. You can say there is a great variety. We can agree that for both for human insulin and analog insulin that we see a great variety in terms of the government prices and the public private purchasing. Government prices, I know you all agree that the, the public sector, so we don't have always the availability of insulin, which is where the price is a little lower. So we see that why there are so disparities is the same companies, as I said, that three companies actually control 97% of the world market. So why these disparities exist? This is coming again from Sub-Saharan Africa because we said that about one in seven people in Sub-Saharan African countries actually receive, have a kind of secured supply of insulin. And you see the public and private sector, sector, how it differs from each country. These are the published data from, uh, from 2021. So it's not old data. So this is the fact that we are facing today. The, I'm, I'm not, I'm a very much part of this diabetes community. I'm also a colleague, a scientist, and also leading the, our International Diabetes Federation today. I'm very much together with you but I'm trying to bear this grave situation together with you. If you see this, for example, the rapid insulin analogs. So this is the kind of med uh, med uh, the medical reimbursement trends to cover the insulin production from 1991 to 2014. So you see that rapid acting analogs, it is, it is uh, receiving the highest reimbursement trends to cover insulin products. You see that nowadays that I'm, I, I will come probably at the end that I'm thinking to revisit our IDF guidelines for 
type two diabetes treatment. The cost is that many people are saying that can we go for the best option because people cannot afford it. Because why people cannot afford it? Because of the disparities that we saw the cost of production is the similar, but selling prices are so different from countries to countries and also from the government sector to the private sector. And the reimbursement situation that you see that that's, that is making it impossible for our people to have, to have access to the life-saving drug like insulin. So insulin therapy is in brief history, the first, it was formulated in 1922, that now I'm talking about therapy, was also weight-based and calculated conservatively to prevent the hypoglycemia and preserve limited amount of insulin available. So this was the dose that was the based on the body weight to insulin. In 1982, that's this based upon clinical experience on human regular insulin, Schuyler et al. suggested that a total basal dose, TBD, should be about 40% of the total daily dose. Then it comes 19, 1999, the rule of nine, uh, three was proposed to estimate the carbohydrate to insulin ratio or the CIR that you all familiar with. Current formulation of estimating correction factor, the CF, are based on suggest by Davidson et al. Yeah, of the 1500 rule later modified to 700, the CF was 700 to TDD or the total daily dose. So this is the, this is the brief story that how the insulin therapy was developed. Now you, you all know this concept of type one diabetes that's basal requirements that how, so it's mainly we are thinking of two things that is the weight based and the carbohydrate factors that is, that is the basis for our insulin calculation. If we look at the people with diabetes, you see that we have most cases of type two diabetes are in non, in non isolated population. We are not talking about the ones done right. You see that you have this diabetes component pathways, the obesity, insulin action, insulin resistance, adipose tissue dysfunction, inflammation, fat distribution, and beta cell function. <coughs> if you distribute it to the people with diabetes, they are not equally distributed. They are not equally, but we are treating them equally under the same formula. As you know that WHO is now changing the type twos. They are now coming up with the subtypes of type two in their definition. Because they are seeing that the differences, the differences in terms of how much the obesity is affecting, how much the insulin is action, action and how much insulin resistance, adipose tissue dysfunction and income. So these are very different. You see that are, these people are not equally affected by all these factors. If we look at the diabetes prevalence by BMI, that is weight-based that I'm talking about, that if you see this BMI, the European, the Mexican, the South American, the Russians, African, Middle East, Indian subcontinent, Central Asia, Southeast Asia. So you see this obesity, this weight actually is affecting the prevalence, diabetes of prevalence very differently in different population. But we are using the same formula for all population. So if you think of the, from the evolutionary point, now I'm thinking of the evolutionary point, if you say that you see that from an evolutionary perspective, human blood glucose levels have likely evolved towards their current equilibrium over thousands of years as a response to genetic or environmental perturbations. The stability of blood glucose regulation has developed through a hyperbolic function of two variables. That is the insulin sensitivity and insulin response, probably. And this global migration that we have, the migration is not new that I'm, I'm living more than 35 years in Norway coming from Bangladesh. This trend is nothing new. People, human have always migrated. Have behavioral changes have made some adjustments in factors that influence the insulin sensitivity and secretion such as body size, composition, energy expenditure, storage and heat production. As these factors changed novel genetic variants, the mutations have also pushed some subpopulation to different points of stability. 
and this is this is very important if we if we think of of for example the maximum the optimal effect of thera, uh, the effectivity of insulin therapy we talk about the genetic predispositions this is the data that was uh, this was taken the racial and ethnic differences in the burden of type 2 diabetes you see that the east asians american european and african the genetic risk was score was actually calculated by summing up the number of risk alleles weighted by the published effect size across 63 published variants in different racial ethnic groups. You see that how this genetic score differs in terms of the risk for diabetes in different population. So genetic, genetic predisposition that we talk about, which actually I say that very often that when we do not have any answer to a question, we say that Allah knows it bit, best. And in medical terms, when we do not know the answer, we say probably it's because of the genetic disposition and because nobody knows what is it, but it sounds very scientific. We have not yet identified any genetic markers other than the monogenetic form of diabetes. For type two diabetes in general, we have not identified any genetic markers that these are the genetic markers that is, that is responsible for type two diabetes. However, I'm not excluding the possibility that this, there is a relationship, but I'm saying having said it, there is a big varieties across the ethnicities. This, this is a paper, I think this, this slide is quite interesting that what I see, that here you see this, for example, the insulin sensitive in, index and acute insulin response to glucose. And is three, is two different, uh, is three different population, the Africans, the Caucasians, and East Asians. The East Asians here, we're talking about Japanese, Taiwan. <coughs> this not, not, for example, Bangladesh or India, which is, so what we see that, for example, if you this look at this insulin sensitivity index, that you say that Africans have significantly lower insulin sensitivity. If you look at this, for example, the Africans, which is, which is, uh, which is the white uh, dots, that you can see that they have the significantly lower insulin sensitivity and higher insulin response than other two groups. So they produce a lot of insulin, but they have also higher, very high insulin resistance. On the other hand, if you look at the East Asians, their insulin sensitivity is quite good, but they produce very low level of insulin. Any changes in this equilibrium? So we can say that why we see that there is a kind of explosion of this of, of diabetes today globally. This probably can give us an explanation that anything happens in the East Asian population that where the, for example, adiposity, that which we see more commonly, that if the adiposity increases, the insulin resistance will increase. They produce lower level of insulin. And if the insulin resistance increases, there will be an explosion of diabetes. In the African population, it is the same, but we see that in the, in the opposite way, because they have higher insulin resistance, but they also produce a lot of insulin. In the, the, the Caucasians, however, as we see that they have the lowest rate of diabetes globally, and they are, uh, they are actually false in the middle. So they have, they have an intermediate level of insulin resistance and, and good level of insulin production. So this picture actually, actually tells us, uh, give us an explanation that why we see this explosion of diabetes globally. This is a paper from, 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 the, uh, from African women. There's a, there's a black African and a white uh, European. You see that, for example, the, the pathogenesis of type two diabetes and risk in black African in South African perspectives. You see that insulin secretion and hepatic insulin clearance is clearly is different from this black African to the white European woman. And this is, this, is a, this is a kind of pathogenesis of type two diabetes in black Africans and the South African population. You see that here is the, what is that? They have the gluteal, gluteal fat that causes the hypertrophy, fibrosis, inflammation, and, 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 uh, and the glucagon uh, receptors problem, leading to the hyperinsulinemia and beta cell response. Pancreas. So it's a typical situation that we see in the African population. But if we look at, for example, the 
the Asian population, you see that, for example, there is a there is a big difference in terms of the um, uh, this, for example, the rapid modernization changes of environment, lifestyle, and diabetes mellitus in the obesity. So we have a low BMI, large weight circumferences, put Asian people at high risk for beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance. We see that there are differences. <coughs> If you look at this, for example, the fat distribution, that there are two individuals with some body fat percentages, age, sex, and BMI from, of 24 kgs. They have identical BMI of 24 kgs. You see, we are talking about the weight. We, because weight, again, I'm saying holding the weight because weight is the basis for our insulin calculation. If you look at this, for example, the, on the left is, uh, on the right is the Asian subjects. With the same BMI, we have 3.7 liters of visceral fat, whereas in the European Caucasians, we have one liter of visceral fat. And if you look at two individuals with the same body fat percentages, we talk about the, not only the with same identical body fat percentages, sex and waist are compressed of 84 centimeters, we see that the Asians have 4.2 liters of visceral fat and the Caucasians have 1.2 liters of visceral fat can we still use the same formula for the insulin calculation? This is also the insulin response to oral glucose tolerance. That is, we see this, how it differs in terms of Caucasians and the Japanese. Insulinogenic index and HOMA insulin resistance, you see that is significantly different in these two populations, the Caucasians and the Far East, that is the Japanese population. This is the blood glucose that you can give the given the same carbohydrate load that we talk about carbohydrate factor, the CF factor, that given the same carbohydrate, you see that the Caucasian and the Chinese, that after 120, to 120 mit, uh, minutes, after two hours, that these Chinese have significantly higher level of glucose production compared to the Caucasians. But we give the, we give the same same insulin therapy. We, ca we calculate, we have the fraction for this carbohydrate ratio factor is similar. We have seen this percentages of participants with HB1C less than 7% by rate and ethnicity. I think that it's, uh, it's very, very different. I'm sorry that it's not coming this picture. Yeah, this one that we, it is also differed by different population. Let's go to this effectivity on racial ethnic differences in achieving hemoglobin A1C less than 7% with more than 12 weeks of insulin therapy. We have the basal, we have the, we have this insulin Lispro mix 75-25 and Lispro mix 50-50. You see that, for example, if we look at this Caucasians, Latino Hispanics, Asian, African descent, how it differs. This target, achieving the target is very different given the same therapy to three, to, to, to these four, four ethnic groups of population. And this also, this achievement of glycemic, blood pressure, lipids, we see that all differs in different by ethnicity. So what we observe in conclusion that we can say that diabetes prevalence Complications mortally differ significantly by ethnicity. Genetic risk score differs significantly by ethnicity. Body composition differs significantly by ethnicity. Insulin resistance by BMI differs significantly by ethnicity. Insulin sensitivity and insulin response differ significantly by ethnicity. Insulin response to glucose carbohydrate differs significantly by ethnicity. Glucose control by HB1C differs significantly by ethnicity. And all, with, all this, with all this knowledge, we are not critically asking, can we give the same, can we use the same formula across all ethnicities to give the insulin therapy? So what I would say that take home message, we see the East Asian, the Chinese, Japanese, the Koreans have lower insulin production, but high insulin sensitivity. South Asians like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and I think the South Asians will also bring them Middle East 
pretty close to it. It's relatively low insulin production, but high insulin resistance due to high visceral fat. The Africans have high insulin production, but high insulin resistance, and Caucasians have good amount of insulin secretion and lower levels of insulin resistance. So this is, this is the, when we put them together, then we see that that's the way the, the people differs physiologically. In conclusion, I would say that today the international guidelines address, uh, addressing racial, ethnic, uh, or specific clinical practice recommendations are very limited or do not exist. It is evident that treatment response to insulin therapy by race, ethnicity varies and warrant further large trials, including the efficacy and safety of different regimen of insulin in diverse population. All diabetes is increasing and particularly in non-white population we need larger body of evidence to better understand the impact of race, ethnicity, of the different response to insulin therapy on the safety and the efficacy. And insulin therapy guidelines based on trials, mainly in white okay. communities, is less likely to secure the efficacy and safety of the people with diabetes and other ethnic groups. My dear colleagues, we bring, we bring the best evidence that was published yeah. in the Western medias based on the Caucasian population. And then we said, that this is the best evidence that we have. We do not critically ask that whether these findings, they are very good science, but whether this science is applicable to all population. Isn't it our responsibility? Isn't it time for us to develop our own findings? so that we can build up our own guidelines. The biggest problem for us to build up our guidelines is because we have very little evidence. That is, that is the evidence being published. So I will encourage my dear colleagues and friends to focus on research so that you can publish your data so that a guideline can be developed based on evidence from your data, not from the Caucasian population. So I, I think this was the virtual Congress for 2021. This is an old, uh, but we, I would also welcome you that we'll, IDF will have this World Congress this year in December 24 uh, to 8 of December 2022 in Lisbon. So I hope most of you will be able to participate there. So with this word, I will say thank you and uh,